because if we don't deal with climate change, we won't have a conversation about pickup artists because we'll all be <laughs> maybe we'll be figuring out different ways of grooming our fins to pick up women. <laughs> <laughs> if we can evolve to deal with this crisis that's getting at us. Um, but look, uh, President Obama's EPA today uh, has announced what are very significant new uh, regulations on carbon. The Environmental Protection Agency unveiled new standards today that will be calling for a 30% cut in carbon emissions from power plants by the year uh, 2030. Now, you know, this is significant in a couple of ways. And at this point, we have to acknowledge that President Obama, after, you know, Congress did not pass his original version of cap and trade during the first, uh, I believe it was in 2010, it was before the midterm. So in his first term, obviously, and when Democrats still ran Congress, uh, cap and trade failed to pass. Since then, very quietly, with new rules on efficiency standards for cars, with bringing carbon under the uh, umbrella of the Clean Air Act and what the kind of the EPA can regulate unilaterally, President Obama has actually been making some very, very significant moves on climate. And if these rules kick in as they're planned on kicking in and they actually happen, he will be very close towards, and if not completely fulfilling, the commitments he made to cut uh, U.S. carbon emissions, uh, the same commitment that he made uh, in, in Copenhagen in the climate summit in uh, 2010. So these are very, very significant. And they definitely, you know, again, it's not they're not, quote unquote, killing coal, but it certainly is going to be expediting the process of phasing out coal, which, frankly, we all know is necessary if we're going to have a serious uh, climate strategy. Um, the rules will have a great deal of flexibility in terms of how states implement them. Uh, there's obviously a significant reaction on the right. Uh, Al Gore has said that these are historical um, and really uh, uh, radical commitments that have not been seen by a previous U.S. administration, and that's definitely the case. And the other, the other thing that's important here is that with this level of – as, as, these proposals are very systemic, and they are going to create a context where there has not been a coherent national strategy, as we know, on climate, which would help facilitate and expedite the type of kind of technological and business development that we need in various sectors to develop renewable and post-carbon economies and technologies. I think that this is going to make a significant step in kind of unleashing that capacity because money can start to flow in places when there's coherence about where that money is going to go and what the actual structural policy is. So, so again, credit where credit is due. If you include the investments in renewables in the stimulus and you look at the ruling on car efficiencies and now this – you have to give President Obama a lot of credit. Now, there's two important caveats here. One of the reasons that he's been able to start moving aggressively against coal uh, and, the, and the sort of context for cutting these emissions and even some of the reasons that emissions have been falling is because we have been uh, moving and obviously aggressively exploiting natural gas. And the Obama administration has been tremendously in favor uh, and pushed uh, natural gas uh, exploration, not only in the United States, but in fact globally, uh, which I talked about with Steve Horn several months ago. Now, obviously, uh, natural gas does not appear to have the same kind of carbon uh, output, obviously, as something like coal does, but there's debate about how much it actually does, and a lot of accusations, in fact, that many in the industry and outside it are exaggerating the extent to which it's more, relatively speaking, carbon neutral. And then, of course, the other aspect of fracking and the other aspect of natural gas is that there is a hell of a lot of evidence that it causes significant local environmental and public health effects as documented by people like Josh Fox. So this is a subtext of the Obama policy is a natural gas. Now, 
again, this is very similar to Jerry Brown in California. Jerry Brown's probably got one of the most, certainly in terms of his thinking and articulation and a lot of the bills he's passed as governor, he's probably thinking one of the most broadly and systemic ways about climate in the country. And at the same time, he's angered a lot of people in California because he's been quite pro-fracking and quite pro-natural gas. This is going to be a real tension point you'll see between Democratic politicians who, again, I think you have to give President Obama real credit. You have to give Jerry Brown real credit. But they are mainstream Democratic politicians beholden to different industry groups and also uh, you know, trying to do uh, significant moves in as minimally disruptive way as possible. Now, the other thing is that if the Western countries, the developed countries, hit their targets that they've committed uh, under Copenhagen, that not legally binding, but there are sort of aspirations on climate targets, uh, which, as obviously we'll see, that's not necessarily given that they'll hit those targets. With the rise of China, India, uh, uh, Africa, South Africa, uh, Kenya, Brazil, um, you're still obviously talking about a story where per individual there's far fewer outputs uh, and places that are developing and need to raise their standard of living. But again, the objective reality is is that if every if there is the type of vehicle activity on the road in China that there is in the United States per capita, the you know we will literally all suffocate to death. So this is a global problem. Um, it's a global challenge, obviously, uh, and it's going to require many more steps collectively, individually, nationally, and in a local manner. And I think it's also interesting that. This correlates with a lot more people taking both radical activism in their own hands, like Bill McKibben. Um, we have to keep a strong eye on Keystone. President Obama's put that decision off again. But again, if he doesn't reject Keystone, that undermines radically all of this. If he rejects Keystone, that will be another significant step um, in his ending up with a strong record on climate. Uh, but also uh, people engaging locally in terms of building sustainable local economies, investing in local agriculture, uh, moving to less car-dependent ways of living. All of this stuff obviously uh, is synergistic, even if it's not formally synergistic. So very, very significant announcement. We'll see what happens from here with the significant caveats. Obviously, that it, well, and also it's important to add that even with these cuts, we're still heading uh, towards some, you know, and still dealing with the effects of what we've already done, the reliance on natural gas, and then the reality that with the outputs of China, India, other developing countries, uh, with their massive scales and economies, that the whole equation of how we kind of globally coordinate to bring this stuff down uh, is a significant challenge. But nonetheless, it's a really, really big announcement. It's incredibly important. Uh, and again, this is the classic case of, right, this is why you would vote for President Obama over Mitt Romney. Not because President Obama is great and the best thing in the world and there isn't a million things to object to, but it doesn't get realer than this. You are not going to get this type of cut in carbon emissions directed by the president and the EPA under President Romney or any Republican. It's not going to happen. There's a real difference. Uh, the president deserves a lot of credit, and he also deserves a lot of uh, wariness and keeping an eye on him on other things. Okay.